Hi, I'm Guy Lawrence and you are listening to the Guy Lawrence podcast. If you're enjoying this content and you want to find out more and join me and come further down the rabbit hole, make sure you head back to guylawrence.com.au. Awesome guys, enjoy the show. James, welcome to the podcast. Hey Guy, it's uh, great to be here. Mate, if a stranger stopped you on the street and asked you what you did for a living these days, what would you say? Ooh, it depends on the stranger, I guess, because uh, it takes, you need to judge character before you, can, before you can give a response. But typically, my shorthand answer is I'm a filmmaker. And I think that that is a simple way of explaining the mechanics of what I do. Fair enough. And then, and then that would open up a ton of questions, I have no doubt, and stuff we'd like to explore today. Now, I've, you know, we, we've, we've interacted many, many times over many years, you know, myself through 180 and yourself through the Food Matters journey. Mm-hmm. And what I'm really intrigued about, James, is that I don't think you set out to be a filmmaker. Mm. And there must have been a decision to go, I'm going to go and make a movie considering you didn't, would it be fair to say that you hadn't, because you hadn't made it before, you might have not had the skill set, so it might have been a bit naive of you to go, to think that you could go and make a movie, but you went on and did it, and you not only did it, it was phenomenal. How does one end up getting to that point and making a decision as big as that? Because I think most of us tend to like the idea of pursuing our dreams, or Mm. like the idea of mixing it up, but we we can quite often not make those decisions Mm. until it's too late. True. You know, for me, Guy, you know, that's a great question. I think it was really a combination of pain and inspiration. Uh, Certainly pain was a big trigger point in, in our family uh, because my father was, was suffering. He was not well. And we could see that he was being pushed down a path of mainstream medicine of more drugs more testing, more drugs, more testing, more drugs, and offered no real hope for getting well. Then we had this personal interest in nutrition and natural medicine and understanding the root cause of of disease from a different viewpoint and how if you use nutrition and natural therapies, which are not patented and you cannot make exclusive profits over, which is why they're not marketed to people, then that can really help to address a lot of the underlying issues that are going on in my father's life, were going on in my father's life and are potentially going on in a lot of other people's lives suffering from, you know, the the ills of being a modern human living in a modern domesticated world. And so it was those two ideologies, the pain that my father was going through and the inspiration to want to share this message with a lot of people coming together. And I think also, one other thing to sort of backtrack this beginning, because I think your question alludes to this idea of like, where did this begin? How did this begin? And, and for, for us, there was also a lot of personal development work that we were doing at the time. I okay. mean, you know, Tony Robbins, this sort of work and like understanding that, wow, we constantly limit ourselves every day in every moment through our language and the talk that we have between our mind and the rest of our body, whether we say it out loud or it's subconscious all through conditioned belief systems. So I think the coalescing of those three things were really powerful for us. One was the pain that my father going was, was, was going through. Number two was this inspiration and learning all this information around nutrition and natural medicine and seeing that it wasn't very widely available And three, the personal development work in sort of unlocking more potential that, that, that I had, that Laurentine had, that we could potentially use to help people. And that was, that was really where it began. Yeah. Right. And was it as simple as like, when was Food Matters made? 2007? Mm -hmm. Wow. That's we started filming in 2007, maybe even late 2006. No, 2007, we started filming. And uh, it released mid-2008. And we'd been planning really since 2005, 2006, thinking about these ideas, watching films like The Secret that were coming out at the time. It was like, you know, you can 
visualize and manifest your ideal life. We're like, wow, we'd love to help people. We'd love to like get this message to more people. So I think it was the coalescing of this personal development message and also this, this nutrition message together. Okay. Okay. And what fascinates me as well, because if I can kind of relate to it even more on my journey over the last 18 months from walking away from 180 to explore mm -hmm. what I truly wanted to do. There's like an element of self-belief and self, there's something great there that's coming, coming out of you that you just know you've got to listen and answer to. But at the mm -hmm. same time, it's quite terrifying. <laughs> so yeah. they're stepping into that unknown like when you started that Food Matters journey then before you even started shooting film, was that what was going on for you? Did you like believe in it wholeheartedly that this was just going to work and I'm all in and I'm just going to throw everything on the line because I'm convinced or was it, or was it like not quite like that? I don't know. It, it was, it was very much all in. And I, I think we developed <clears throat> whether it was a false or a true sense of of this projected idea that we could take to the world. We could clearly see the problem existed. We could see that people were sick, people were suffering, they still are today. Yeah. And there was this chasm, this wide chasm of, of knowledge, a knowledge gap that existed. And we were like, hang on, there's people that are suffering and then here's knowledge over here that can help. How can we bring that together? So, so in essence, the theory is sound. Then we went deeper and we said, how can we back this up? so that we can convince our ideological, emotional self that there is some real sense of tactile, practical, commercial sense to this. And, and I always talk to people, Guy, when I'm interviewing them for a position with Food Matters or speaking to my team, I say Food Matters as a group, as a company with multiple companies under it now, is essentially, we essentially dance between philanthropy and commerce. We are philanthropic in nature. We're there to serve people, their people. We're there to serve our community, to serve our tribe, to give them access to the best knowledge, the best information, so that they can make better decisions for their health, for their life, and transform their life. And we're commercial in nature because we need to make a profit so that we can be individually sustainable, so that we don't have to answer to anybody except ourselves, and so we can maintain the purity of our mission and vision. If we were funded by Nestle, then the information on our channel is going to be geared towards Nestle safe and their products are great. I'm using them as an example and not in any way, particularly being derogatory to one vertical or one company. However, this, this idea of dancing between philanthropy and commerce, I think people, when they're starting an idea or starting to think about what am I going to do? They think with their heart, and they're this ideological viewpoint of the world and go, this is so amazing. And they might start something and it might fail. And then they're like, Oh my God, I'm a failure. I'm not good at this. I'm going to go back and get a job. Whereas that's not true. The truth would be maybe you need to wear the other cap, which is how commercially viable is this idea? Now, a lot of people are going to say that's unartistic of you. If you're a filmmaker, that's unartistic of you to think about the commercial viability of a piece of art that you're creating. However, I would say unless you, are, unless you have independent funds and you do not care for a sustainability of profit, that's okay. If you have that, if you are got access to unlimited funds and you don't need to make a profit, then you sit more squarely in that philanthropy area and you're just about how do I spend the money to create something to help people. And there are some people in the world at that level most of the rest of the world doesn't have unlimited access to cash or funds. And if they save their own money, like we did, it's, it's, you've got not a huge pool of money. You know, it was, we worked really hard to save money and it's a precious amount of money and you need to, to decide on how carefully we invest that capital. So we went and did the research on that side as well, which is we studied internet marketing. We looked at, the theories of how do we take a message to people and make it commercially sustainable. Then we actually did this process guy of running businesses in our head and we would wake up each day and pretend we're running that business and, and, and act out the best and worst case scenarios. So, so an idea before we've made food matters was we were going to use these interviews to do seminars around the world and then get people to come to like retreats and we can get naturopaths and nutritionists and iridologists and massage therapists and yoga teachers and bring them together and bring people together and create a transformation environment and do that a few times a year. 
Then we started to do the, a day in the life of that. And we're running that business in our minds. I mean, people must've thought we were crazy taking a phone call. Oh, this naturopath can't make it. They canceled or this happened here. We're like, this is hard. This is, this is <laughs> too hard. It's too many moving parts, too much possibility for failure. So we said, how do we simplify this even further so that we can be effective at getting this message out there and be effective at maintaining a profit, which means a totally different headspace. What's my gross profit going to be? What is a general understanding of my general and administrative expenses before I get to my net profit? And how can I reinvest that net profit to make more films? So we went through this deep guy. And I think that a lot wow. of people might jump to an idea a little fast. And I think that you, you really need to consider in detail the mechanics of running a business because ultimately every venture out into the universe is a business in some way, shape or form because of the way we've structured our world, good or bad, no comment. It's how it is. And if you can maintain a sense of independence and profitability, then you can maintain a purity of message true to your founding mission or vision statement. And thankfully we've been able to do that. And, and 10, 12 years on from the release of food matters, we're pushing content out to the world. We're helping alleviate suffering and we're helping light people up and create transformation in their lives. And nothing could be more uh, profound f f in the sense of, of pride that I, I feel in my team, in the community to help bring this together and the filmmakers that help bring content onto FMTV. And, and that is uh, something that's, that's I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about and, and to continue doing. And I think that everyone has the possibility to do something like this, but it takes deep hard work at understanding mechanics of business in a way. Yeah. Oh, there's, there's huge lessons there. I think it, we can all romanticize about the fact that, you know, yes, I'm going to just follow my heart and blissfully and aware go in. And then it's not until the harsh realities of business can start to come along that you, you have to hone in quite quickly. And I think it also highlights the importance of actually having somebody to even mentor and, and has walked the paths before you so they can foresee the, the obstacles that you're going to come up against before you've even walked it. Because if you haven't, you're not going to know what's there, right? You know, there's, there's, otherwise it's all completely blind luck to a degree and, and maybe your intuition, yeah. which I think will only get you so far at the same time. I've, I'm really intrigued as well about purpose. And I heard you quote, actually, I was listening to an interview the other day. I'm trying to think where it was on. But, um, and it spoke about purpose and actually spoke about, do we all have a purpose? And you, you actually spoke about your purpose, about overcoming fear. And you feel like that's a deep part of you. And that really, really intrigued me because I think, um, you know, fear can be such a debilitating, uh, you know, anchor for all of us to stop us moving forward as well. So mm. could you elaborate a little bit on that, first of all, before we, we delve into other questions around purpose? Yeah, I, I think that I think we're all scared at some level of something. You know, we, we all have fears and we all have things that we worry about or obsess about negatively. We obsess about, you know, what are other people going to think of me? Hmm. We obsess about what, what if I fail? We obsess about um, ideas around... Um, maybe I'm not good enough. You know, we're fearful of really stepping into who we truly are and who we're capable of being. And I think these fears are conditioned into us. I take my son surfing, who's five, Hugo, and I take him surfing at a local break here. I'm currently in Vanuatu in, in the Pacific. And I, I take him surfing and it's on a reef break and I'm pushing him into waves and it's shallow reef, it's sharp. And people look at me like I'm crazy and an irresponsible father. And yet one person said to me, he's another surfer out there, um, he's an ex-professional surfer. And he said to me, all fear that children have is taught. Hmm. It's fear that's taught. I mean, children are naturally fearless. I mean, I see Hugo climb a tree and I'm like, get down, you're too high. Or I see him walk next to him and I'm like, get back, you're too close to the edge of that cliff. Or he says, dad, push me into this big wave. And I'm like, that's, you know, that's, dangerous but then you start to realize wow has my fear been conditioned into me and am i conditioning fear into my child so therefore we all have fears 
And I think that that's natural. And I think that when we think about business or stepping out of our comfort zone, it is scary. And yet one way to debilitate fear is was taught to me by one of the greats in personal development. People cringe at him sometimes, but if you read through his big accent, his big personality, there is absolute gold in there. Tony Robbins says, take massive action. And I love that too. So you think about it, you plan it out well, you do stuff. But if you get stuck in analysis, you can just get stuck in analysis for years and never do anything. If you rush in too quick, it can be silly because you maybe didn't think about things very well. But you have to combine those two. And I think to mitigate fear, you just take action. Just take that next step. And it's a leap of faith, so to speak. If you've done the, if you've rationalized it, you've thought it through and you're ready to take action, then take action. And I think that in the process of taking action, the next steps begin to unfold for you. We, we started taking action with Food Matters. We did our first interview. It was horrible. The audio was bad. You know, the interview wasn't that great. The guy had a really thick accent. It wasn't his fault. I mean, he's French. Uh, he was a great guy. Arnaud Apotek. I remember his name well. It's actually a Dutch last name, which I think means uh, pharmacy in French, Apotek. And Arnaud was his first name. And he was one of the heads of um, the anti-genetically modified movement for Greenpeace. He was the head spokesperson oh, wow. globally. And we interviewed him on the Rainbow Warrior, which is the Greenpeace's ship in Doha, in the port of Doha in Qatar in the Middle East. I mean, this is the most crazy interview. Unfortunately, it never got used, but we took action. We started, you know, we made some mistakes. We went to the next interview and we interviewed like uh, Hurt Saukemalke in Holland. I remember that. And it was in the German Dutch border and that was okay, but he had a really thick accent. It was great. I mean, the best content. He's the head of the Orphan Molecular sort of European uh, group on this. And then we interviewed Philip Day, in the United Kingdom. And we were still like trying to convince people that we could get an interview, you know, They're like, who are you guys? Where are you from? And then once we got Philip, we said, well, we want to interview this person. He's like, you guys are great. I'll connect you with somebody. Mm. Then we got a connection to Charlotte Gerson. Then we got a connection via a friend that we met to David Wolf. David Wolf interviewed, gave one of the best interviews of his career, I think, for Food Matters. And that catapulted him to a whole new level. He said, James, people come up to me on a train in Russia and say, David Wolf, food matters. <laughs> and like, you know, so that was a, a groundbreaking for him in a way. And he was already amazing. I'm not saying we're any part of his success, but he did credit a lot of his extra notoriety yeah. because of that. It went on Netflix, but he also helped make the film, you know, so it was a great partnership. And I, I'm still send so much loving energy to David you know, just about every day that I'm alive. And I always think about him when he says, is this the best day ever? You know? And so I think that to get out of fear, it's about taking action. So think well, think deep, plan well, plan deep, then put it aside, take massive action. I think that that process I've kept true guy to this day in about every two or three years, I, I, I jokingly say that I blow everything up and take massive action. Right. If I look at the last 10 or 12 years of what I've done since that time you know my life has been a series of big inflection points where i've taken a lot of action or like now moved to another country you know essentially adopted a 12 year old boy from a remote solomon islands and helped putting him through school moved to los angeles and then decided to drop everything and start a streaming tv channel uh even to before we started food matters we we left really comfortable careers in australia dropped everything booked two one-way tickets to france and, and went to France and tried to get work and got work over there and ended up working for two of the top 10 wealthiest people in the world, driving their private yachts around. And then that became then studying nutrition and giving all that away, the comfort, the travel, the lifestyle, everything to go and spend our entire life savings in a, in a year and a half period, making food matters and putting it all on the line. So that didn't come out of the blue. It came through doing the personal development work, but then, deep thought, deep planning, massive action. Yeah. And that, that to me has been profound. And I'll keep to that motto until today. And, and you know, in the next three years, Guy, I could be doing something radical and different, but I know that on the other side of those big changes has lied the deepest growth, the deepest breakthroughs, the biggest success I couldn't imagine, and also being able to reach more people or 
discover something more of, of who I am. So that, that's been a, an integral part of, of my journey. Amazing. And I've, have you taken massive action and, and failed? Because I think people are scared of that failure as well. You know, mm. and then how do you respond if you've gone, oh my God, this has not worked out at all the way I envisaged, mm. you know? I, I, you know, Guy, that's a great question. I've probably trained my brain. I'm, I'm a hyper optimist. And I, I think that I've really worked hard to train my brain to see the opportunity and the positivity in everything. Okay. And I approach my life more and more now, and everybody in my team will attest to this. Every day I walk into the office when I'm in Australia, I walk in, I hug everybody that's there. I give them a kiss. If they're a lady, I don't kiss the guys. <laughs> Although I have kissed a few of them sometimes, just on the cheek kiss and a hug and I learned this from a train conductor in France and it's an amazing story maybe we go there but I basically connect in with them and I tell them I'm like oh my god I'm, I'm so shocked and then what, what's happened what's gone wrong and I said no I'm shocked that I'm alive and I get the opportunity to have this experience of life hmm. and I, I approach life as this this gift you think about a gift right you get a car you get a surfboard you get money or you get an endowment or you get a trust fund or you get, you get, you're happy, right? Oh my God, thanks for this gift. We got given this gift of life through some miracle, which is a miracle. And yet we don't really trip over that, that, that excitement of getting that gift. Like, yeah, I'm alive. Are you kidding me? The, the, the opportunity that we have to be alive is an amazing gift. And I think it goes past us and goes over us most every day. So I try to not let that go past me. So every day that I get an opportunity to be alive and to be human, I see as an enormous gift. Yeah. And so when I have challenges or problems, I get, I get anxious, I get worried, I get upset. And then the next morning, and I maybe don't sleep that well. I've had some sleepless nights. I've had things go bad. I've had decisions that I've made. And progressively, as you become bigger or, or you play on a different level, the, the problems get bigger. They become bigger, you know. And I've had things come up in the last 12 months where, and I've had things fail. And I always know because the reason Food Matters began was because of a failure in our family, a challenge in our family. And so it taught me, I sit here right now, 10 years later, and I'm, I'm in Vanuatu, I'm with my family, I'm traveling to America next month, I've, I've made one of the, a film that I've been so proud of and spent years in production on Transcendence, and people are watching it and having these incredible experiences, and I've connected with all these, and I sit here and go, wow, if my dad was not sick, if there was not a point of pain and failure in my family, this wouldn't have happened. And so any time now that I experience pain and failure, I try to close the gap and close the time period from pain and failure to thank you for that opportunity. Mm. Now, most people, not most people, a lot of people, some people, that, can, that gap is very wide. So there'll be a pain or a problem and it might take two or three years and then eventually they're like, oh, that was good because I met that person or this happened and they can, in hindsight, rationalize it. Everyone who gets cancer doesn't say that's a great thing. They always say it's the worst thing ever. And for some people, it might take six years. And then in six years time, they're like, oh my goodness, if that didn't happen, I wouldn't have met this person. I wouldn't have seen this, or I wouldn't have stopped and changed my life. For some people, they don't get that awakening. Some people who compress that time period can have the awakening shortly after the pain or shortly after the shock. And I think a, a sign of, a spiritually evolved person, maybe like the Dalai Lama or Muktananda from the City Yoga lineage or, or Guru Mai, who's the recent head of that, or any spiritual path person you can think of, depending on what you believe in, they're able to close the gap of problem and pain and realization that it's perfect and that everything will be okay very fast. And I think that's a really profound, um, that's a really profound gift. And so whenever something bad happens to me, I worry about it. I mourn it or I'm sad about it, but then I'll quickly go, what is this here to teach me? How can I grow from this experience? Or as one of my coaches will say, what's the lessons that I've learned from this? Yeah. So that I've, I'm, I'm paying, like I've made business mistakes and I call that my MBA training. 
you know, I'm, pay- I'm paying for that. Oh, okay. That cost me a bit of money, that training, but I've reframed it. It's not a failure. It's training. It's, it's, it's learning it's lessons. And then I go, okay, I'm not going to make that mistake again. Yeah. And so I think it's about reframing challenges and problems, but I think also if you have a problem or a challenge and you didn't put enough thought into the planning of it beforehand, then maybe that's your lesson. Maybe you need to plan deeper, you know? So everything I think has a lesson and a purpose for us. And the quicker we can bring that realization close to the problem and shorten that time period, I think the more profound we can use these examples and challenges to grow faster and evolve faster. Yeah. That's my, my thought. Beautiful. Yeah. I, I, if I'm not mistaken, it's called a refractal period. Sure. Cool. Yeah. And, um, so you, you opened two loops for me then, and I'll, I'll go to close both of them. One of them was you know, that sense of optimism and that you're very optimistic. And, you know, like you're saying, your rule set seems to be very low in terms that you're actually just grateful to be above the ground every day and, and loving life and everything else is a bonus. Is mm-hmm. that always been you or is, or is it a practice that you cultivate around that daily? I, I, think, I, ha- I think I had an element of it as a child. I mean, I used to just get excited about surfing. I get excited about playing music. I mean, these very primal, simple things and I'd get childlike excitement. I mean, I surfed yesterday until dark on a remote reef break with maybe 20 people out and they were all local Mi Vanuatu people. Uh, so these village people out there broken boards, everything. And we're just screaming at each other like, woo, hooting. And I think that that, childlike enthusiasm I've tried to keep alive and I think that if you can start to approach life with that enthusiasm then everything's exciting everything's a game and I think that that Warren Buffett or Tony Robbins talks about that as a game the game of life you know and I think it's have fun with it and uh, so I think that that's something that you also need to train because you can easily go negative if something bad happens and something bad happens again then your internal thing goes, well, bad things happen to me. Then you get a bad belief system. Then it's like this cascade of like negativity and negative self-talk that takes you to a bad place. If you ask somebody a question, Hey, how's your day going? Struggling, getting there. Okay. Well then if they say that often enough, then their whole life becomes I'm struggling. I'm getting there as opposed to like, did you just ask me how my day is going? Are you, are you kidding me? Like, I mean, first of all, I'm alive about, about a million people died in their sleep last night, guy, which means about 10 million people lost a family member last night. Far out. Oh, wow. I'm lucky. I'm lucky. I'm, ab- I'm here. I'm above ground. This is awesome. Okay. What, what is the day going to present to me? How can I take this day and do something good, something beautiful, something passionate, and then wake up the next day and give it another go and step by step, just approaching life like that, regardless of the challenges. And I think that has been, I've focused a lot on that, maybe 15 years, 20 years on developing that mindset. I mean, early, late, late teens, early twenties is when I started to get this, this information that I didn't get taught in school about mindset. And I think that has changed me dramatically in the last 10 or 12 years. And I'm not an overzealous personal development, personal growth person. I don't, I, you know, I was reading a book last night and I love reading, I love learning, but I'm just a person that's here on this earth trying to experience life and do good. And I think that the idea of shifting your mindset to, like you said, being grateful for the opportunity to be alive is the cornerstone of any life. I mean, if you can really master that, then, then your life becomes a joy, an absolute joy. Totally. Have you, God, every time you say something, it's triggered more questions on top of more questions. But something for me that I kind of grapple with sometimes is that you find that you can get so caught up being an entrepreneur and, and you've got all these amazing things going on, but we can chase the dream so much that we actually forget to live hmm. from the day-to-day stuff too. Do you ever, have you ever found yourself doing that sway in more to one way or, or are you always kind of No, I'm definitely not balanced. I mean, I would say probably my biggest challenge is that I can go really deep into things. And in the past, I've probably been deeper in things and there's been stresses in other areas of my life. I mean, you think about it, it's like business, personal relationships and family and other. And, and if you're, if you're too heavy on the business side, it's very easy to be lacking on the relationship side. And one of my coaches taught me about transitioning 
And he's like, before you, if you can hear, there's rain outside, just so you know. So, uh, but be, before you come home or as you come home and you're a business mind and I've been going a hundred miles an hour, I'll generally come through the front door and I'll be dumping on everybody. Do you hear about this? And I did this with this person. We've got this call coming up. We've got this amazing opportunity. We're going to do this. And everyone's like, whoa, <laughs> chill <laughs> out, chill out. And it's like, okay, so now I've needed to try transition. So before I come through a door, I was going to stop, you know, Brendan Burchard talks a lot about this as well. Like a transition meditation. He'll say, <laughs> my wife doesn't want the Brendan who's just done the calls guy. My wife wants Brendan, the guy. And so he'll sit in his car and meditate before he comes home. And so I think through some of those self awareness practices, I've been able to develop more balance in my life through being forced through external factors such as this idea of moving to Vanuatu part-time, surfing more. I've been able to focus intensely and then go play, then go be in nature. I think that that's created an incredible balance for me because if I adopt this ideology of being grateful to be here at every moment, then I wouldn't go and spend 99% of my time in business because business is very future thinking. Business, you're thinking about what's next, what's my three months, six months, 12 months strategic plan. You're very much in the future focused. And you, you look at the past very rarely to go, what have I learned? Then you're back in the future. All your meetings about future. What's our Marcom's meeting is future. What's happening this week, future. And so if you're only living in the future, you're missing that joy of the present. So I think that being able to have something that brings you into the present moment can help balance you. And I've developed more sensory acuity about around understanding when I'm in future and when I'm in present and being with Hugo, my boy or Rangi now helps me be in the present because kids are only in the present mm. being in the water and surfing. You have to be in the present. If you're in the future, in the past, you're going to get dumped by the waves. You're going to hit the reef. You know, you just have to be right there. Meditation is in the, is, is in the moment playing music, writing music is in the moment. Being creative is in the moment. Reading a book, yeah, sometimes that's in the moment too. So if I can make sure I've got enough of that, or cooking for me is in the, is in the moment. So if I can balance that, I'm more effective at the business side and I'm more effective at, you know, going, guy, if I check out today, you know, if I'm one of those million people that die in my sleep tonight, you know, touch wood, God forbid, it's not you or me or anybody listening, I wouldn't wish that upon anybody. But if I do, I know that I only haven't lived in the future only haven't lived in that business sense. I've lived also in the present sense. I've gone for a surf. I've played with my children. I've connected with my significant other. I've cooked a meal for somebody that I love. There are things that I really enjoy that ground me. And so I think that's been something that I've had to learn more recently. Yeah, beautiful. Love it. Absolutely love it. I, I'm going I'm to switch gears slightly, but I wanted to bring up transcendence because when I first saw that release, um, I love the name instantly. I was like, wow, that's so, that's, it's, it seemed different, but it was, it, I think it was perfect. Mm -hmm. Where did, where did, well, actually, can you explain what transcendence is and where did that inspiration come from? Because I believe it was a five part talk group. That's right. It's a yeah. five part documentary series. And, you know, with, with Food Matters and Hunger for Change, we took the community, the people that we were sharing this message with, you know, our fans on this journey of understanding that maybe the food and the pharmaceutical and the agricultural industry is more concerned with their own profits than they are with your health and well-being. And so that we had to be essentially the marketing department of cauliflower, the marketing department of vitamin C, the marketing department of celery, because no one was there marketing that anymore, except ancient grandmothers. So, Essentially, once people start to go on a food journey, one of the things that I noticed is that when you change your food, you start to change your mind. You start to think differently. David Wolf said something really interesting to me years ago, and it never made it in any interview or any podcast, never, never got released. He said that how people eat, how you eat, how the eat changes architecture, it changes art, it changes literature, it changes design, it changes how communities interact and cultures interact. And I'm like, that is a wickedly wild nature-based philosophical idea, David. And he's like, okay, yeah. And I've thought about it, it's true. I take two people, I feed one person really horrible processed food, 
and I feed one person beautiful, clean, organic, natural food. And I run that path for one year, two years, three years. What type of persons am I going to create here? Two different people, right? One's going to be more sluggish, lethargic, unhealthy, maybe unhappy, more depressed, more anxious, less better brain function. Maybe they're less optimistic, et cetera. And the other person might be more optimistic, more healthy, more vibrant, et cetera. What type of architects would they be? What type of doctors would they be? What type of teachers would they be for our children? If you've got someone that's allergic to gluten and they're eating white bread and they're snappy and angry, what sort of teacher is that? As opposed to someone who eats more clean and pure and is more calm, more balanced blood sugar, more empathetic, more connected. That's a nutritional biochemical thing. So these, this is really powerful. Then you take someone, let's eliminate this person, not eliminate, let's just leave them on their side journey. That's fine. And no judgment ever. Whatever anybody eats, I don't judge anymore, ever. There's only oneness. Nothing is right or wrong. There is just different ideas. This person here continues on a path of eating well. What happens to this person after three to five years? They start to go on an introspective journey about how their thoughts affect their body and their mind. They start to go into meditation more. They start to consider other spiritual ideologies. This has been my observation. They start to think about things like purpose, purpose of my life, purpose of life. They start to think about being of service to other people, creating conscious businesses, helping people out. So what made sense to me is that why don't, if I've observed that these people at the forefront of this transformational journey that have been juicing for 10 years, eating clean, and they're starting to get onto the spiritual chanting meditation purpose journey. Why don't I make something about a film that's going to help take everyone that's starting this food journey and accelerate this process of awareness and awakening because it's the next step. I think because ultimately why do we eat well? to be a better person. Why do we want to be a better person? We want to be a better example to our children or better to the world or be good to God or, or, or whatever. Okay. Why do we do that? Well, to, to evolve. Why do we evolve? Because we're always growing or evolving. That's the nature of humanity. Well, what's the ultimate goal to transcend, to lift up, to become more aware and more conscious and more kind and more compassionate. And so I think transcendence as an idea is to do that. It's to transcend pain, to transcend limitations, to transcend the ordinary, to transcend a mundane life, to transcend the rat race. You know, these are things that people aspire to. And I wanted to create really a blueprint, uh, a roadmap of, for people over five episodes, where we go through like food, stress, belief systems, values, whose goals are you chasing all the way through to the art of fulfillment and use personal story to take people on that journey. And uh, yeah, it released last November. It's five episodes. It's exclusively on FM TV. Uh, I think you can even watch the first two episodes uh, for free. If you just Google transcendence or something, you'll, you should be able to see it. Um, and I want people to see it. I want people to get transformed and I want people to take this knowledge and go have their own transformation, whether it's yeah. getting over pain or starting a business they love or having the self-awareness to think maybe I should change my internal language and dialogue so that I'm not constantly berating myself or talking down to myself. So that's really where the impetus for the series came from. Beautiful. Love it, mate. Love it. And you had a quite a, quite a array, a lineup, which was, which was fantastic. Was there anyone there that you'd worked with was new and maybe they work stood out for you, but it took you by surprise or in a different way than you expected? Look, I, I think, there's a few people in there that I just, I guess I loved, especially, um, you know, I really enjoyed Wim Hof. I mean, his, his work is amazing as an individual. He's an inspirational guy and he's just showing that something simple and it's funny. I'm going to quote David Wolf again. This is so funny. He said, stone age, stone age technology is going to change the world, you know? And I'm like, okay, sure. And now, you know, eight years later, I'm sitting with Wim Hof and I'm like, this is stone age get cold, breathe, you know, it's like, okay, you know, it's really ancient, basic, you know, stone age technology. And so I think it's really profound. And what he's showing science wise is that, you know, this combination of breath work and cold exposure, but also the belief can have a profound impact on your biology. So he, he was a huge one for me. Um, 
you know, Novak Djokovic, I admire deeply, you know, we've become close friends and I think his dedication to his craft as a tennis player and his focus on nutrition and also mindset is, is second to none. That's why he's become so, so profoundly successful. And I think that we can all take a leaf out of his book and apply that in any way, shape or form to our own lives, whether it's business, yeah. being a better dad, being a better father or mother. Um, Joe Dispenza, who I know that you're uh, a deep fan of his work, um, was one of the, one of the great interviews that I, I, I think I've done in, in 10 years of interviewing people and he was brilliant. Then who else did I love? Oh, I think I really loved Chris Walk okay. as well. And Chris Walk is, he's a, bit of an, he's a bit of an unknown, but his story of his transformation resonates deeply with it. Yeah, amazing, amazing. So it just froze slightly there, but it's, oh, it's okay, okay now. Do you, want me to, do you want me to go over that again, that last bit with Chris Walk? Yeah, please. Okay. And I think finally, probably Chris Walk. He's a bit of an unknown but he has this, this journey of, um, you know, going through cancer, going into the system and then realizing that natural therapies were best, but then realizing that it was actually stress and fear that under were underlying his illness. And that when he's gone and now interacted with all these other cancer patients, anecdotally, he's realized that there was this, this cancer trigger, death in the family, bankruptcy, big financial loss, loss of a loved one, something like this, which then, you know, three, six months later cascaded into a diagnosis wow. and how that if you are going through cancer to really focus on how do I de-stress, how do I remove those stresses from life? And then having Wim Hof's stone age technology to be able to help with that. That was, I mean, that's just episode two. So to me that, that there is, there is a lot of profound knowledge in there. And I say that in a way, not to say that my knowledge is profound. It's really the people that have, brought together in this series is something that has just uh, been really profound for me to experience. And I'm excited for, for people, if they haven't seen it, to go, to go watch it. So if yeah. you just Google FMTV and Transcendence, you'll see a link. You should be able to opt in to watch apps one and two. Uh, I think it's open for a limited time. And then you can sign up with FMTV if you want to watch the other episodes. And, and we'd love to have you as part of the community. Brilliant, mate. Brilliant. Brilliant. I, I spend a week with Wim. I can definitely vouch for for his work, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, I'm going to change gears and ask you a few questions as we wrap up the show. Mm -hmm. And the first question I ask everyone every week, like what's been a low point in your life you've had, but later in life turned out to be a blessing? Definitely dad's illness. Okay. Um, it wasn't a low point for me personally, which is a sad thing to say because I was away, I was living overseas. But whenever I came home, I, the gravity of the, the lowness of the family situation became really heavy. It was like, well, this is really serious because when you're away traveling, living overseas, you're not close to loved ones, but when you come home and I saw that, that's when it became a low point for me. So I think if you're away from your family and loved ones and they're unwell, get home, get mm. close to them and get serious on that. This is serious. What can we do about it? That was a dark place for me because I guess everyone's father is somewhat a mentor for people, for their children. And I think to see your father sick and unwell, it's sad. It's not fun. And so that was, that was definitely a low point for me. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Um, what does your morning routine look like? I love uh, waking up and uh, having some form of hydration first. You know, when, when you're, well, okay, let's be honest. I go to the toilet. Come on. Most people go to the toilet when they first wake up. Uh, but I go to the kitchen and I'll have like a lime juice and water. Okay. Uh, that's typically one thing I'll have to start with. Uh, at the moment, I'm really into this simple little exercise routine that I'm running, which is a quick yoga stretch. So about five to seven of uh, yoga, which mm -hmm. is uh, some two or three really basic sun salutations. Then I'll go for a quick run. And I'm saying it's quick, it's not long, it's like a sprint and I'll go up a hill, it's probably about 500 meters, then I'll go for a bit more of a walk and then another sprint and come back. Like that doesn't take long. It's like, you know, five minutes, seven minutes and I'll come back and I'll do five squats, 
five push-ups. Ah. No, no, no. Ten squats, ten push-ups, ten sit-ups, and a ten-second plank. Then I'll do it again like five times. Like it's not much. It's really basic, simple, just basic ergonomic exercise. And to me, no equipment, no stress, no worries. It's very easy. And then after I do that, I'll go and do more hydration. So I'll do more lemon juice and water, lots of hydration because you feel like it, especially after working out. Then I'll go have a shower and it'll typically be a cold shower, not because I'm so tough and strong, but because I'm currently living in the tropics right now and I need, need a cold shower to reduce my body temperature. And then I'll eat breakfast. And uh, typically I like to have some sort of protein at breakfast. I'll either make a protein smoothie or I'll have eggs or I'll do like a breakfast nori wrap or um, I'll have some sort of paleo granola, um, dairy free, you know, with a coconut milk or something. And then I, then, I, then I sit down and write down all the things that I want to do today, the people I would love to reach out to, the things that I want to achieve. And then I'll have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. And sometimes I love coffee. And oh, yeah. I'll have like a coffee, which I'll have like an organic bean and I'll do like a French press and I'll probably blend it with some coconut oil or MCT and some butter. I'll just have it straight with some coconut milk or soy milk or an almond milk with no sugar. Or I'll have a tea and then I'll go start my day. And to me like that, I love it. I love doing that. It's simple, it's fun, it's no stress. And I stick to that 70% of the time. And I find if I stick to that 70% of the time, hashtag winning. I don't make myself stick to it 100% of the time because I'm gonna fail 100% of the time. There's no way I can do that morning routine every day of my life. So I realize from the beginning, I'm gonna fail and not do it all the time. So I'm not stressed about it. And that, yeah. that works for me. Yeah, beautiful. Love it. Love it. And uh, if you could have dinner with anyone tonight, anywhere in the world, any time frame, who would it be, do you think, and why? <laughs> That's a great question. That's a really great question. Um, you know, I, I, I should be more prepared for this because I tend to ask this question of a lot of people as well. <laughs> oh, uh, I, I mean, I'm going to just say somebody maybe a little bit more random, but I'd probably love to have dinner with Bob Marley. Wow. And, uh, you know, I thought about a lot of people there, like prominent politicians, business people, personal development experts, this sort of stuff. And I can, I can sort of maybe at some level get to those people over the next two or three years. But I had to think who's somebody I couldn't get to or wished I could have got to and Bob. And I really, I'll tell you why Bob, I think Bob, has one of the most profound and important messages for the world. And I think that's why he was uh, killed or assassinated, but, or died. We don't know, but, and I think he had a message of one love, which is the ultimate spiritual message of every religion, pure religion, undoctrinated by humans. And if you look at all Vedic religions, traditional religions, like one people, we are one person. You look at any astronaut that goes up into the sky. What are they? Oh, we're one nation. We're one people is one earth. So I think that whenever we create division, we create pain, we create suffering, we create racial tension. And that's not the ultimate truth. That's not the ultimate reality. The ultimate truth is that no one person is better than the other. Yeah, some people are more educated. Some people have more money. Some people have this, but nobody is better or worse. Everybody is a, is a pure uh, cut from the cloth of God, you know, or creator or ultimate consciousness. And so Bob's message was one love. We're one people, one love. He brought, you know, the whites, the blacks, everybody. And the most common people that went to his concerts were like white college American students, you know. And I think that the, the, the powers that be saw that that was a threat to this divisive politics and this divisive war regime, which makes a lot of money. I mean, war makes money. Go to war with the Middle East. Go to war with the terrorists. Go to war with Vietnam because war machine makes money and it profits for the people that are in power. So Bob challenged that entire system. And I think Bob was a, a prominent spiritual leader. You can look into other assets, aspects of his being. And he mostly sat down with a beer and smoking a spliff and people go, that's irresponsible. And what sort of leader is he? But I think he had it figured out. He's like, guys, <laughs> relax. One love, one people, love your family, love your children, love your neighbor, whether they're black or white or whatever, be peaceful, care for others. That is the ultimate message mm. for the world. And we need it more now than ever before. And so to have dinner with him 
uh, I think would be one of the most profound experiences. And I think I'd find him to be maybe at a guess, a really chilled out <laughs> natural person. And, uh, but I think he'd have very, very uh, profound political ideas for the world. And I think that his message is relevant now more than ever when we live in such a divisive age. So yeah, yeah. Probably. that's a great answer. It's the first time anyone on the show has said Bob. Good. Yeah. Good. <laughs> and uh, last thing with everything we've covered today, is there anything you'd like to leave the listeners to ponder on? I would. And I'd probably say that be, be, be careful, be aware, because ultimately we are conditioned beings. I'm, my behavior in this last hour is a conditioned behavior. And I've trained my conditioning and I've been more aware of my behavior so that I can develop a sense of, Am I acting in accord with my highest sense, my highest being, my spiritual being? Now, some people might see it as a, a, a higher self, their subconscious, their inner self, their pure self, their guide. And I think that the more that you can try to connect, what is my exterior behavior like compared to my internal compass of who I want to be in the world, and the more aware you can be of that, that's a profound gift. I'm not there yet. I'm working on it but it's a gift that we can all cultivate. And I would say, be cautious of your programming because every time you put the TV on, what is on the news? Death, pain, fire, destruction, divisiveness, wrong people, right people, black people, white people, good people, bad people, all BS. And what we, then listen to in between that death, pain, fire, and destruction is ads saying that you're not good enough. You're not sexy enough. You're not healthy enough. Your teeth aren't wide enough. Your abs aren't ripped enough. Your cellulite's too thick. That's also BS. You are perfect as you are and you're always a work of art and you're always a work in progress and you're always changing and that's okay. And everyone's always changing. Everyone's always evolving and everyone's on a different path and a different journey. And to come at that with peace instead of, segregation so i think being aware of your programming and being programmed and how you were parented what did your parents say to you as a child can you interview your parents and say hi um what was going on in your life when i was born were you stressed about money did you argue about it okay maybe i've got some limiting programming about money in my life interesting what else was going on were you beaten did you were you beaten as a child did you beat me as a child even if you didn't want to did you do it did you yell abusive language at me even if you didn't want to? How were you programmed? How were you conditioned? Because the way out of this mess, there's so much beauty and so much mess in our current state. I think that's a natural state of yin and yang, but we want to create more beauty and less, mm. you know, we don't drive down a road and go, oh, look at all that beautiful plastic. Yeah, that's disgusting. Get rid of it. How do we solve a plastic problem? We evolve our level of consciousness and we move out of an old set of programming that says, well, plastic's convenient, let's use it. No, plastic's an absolute atrocious idea because we have to dig up decomposed like dinosaurs and then reprocess it with all these chemicals to make plastic that we just throw out that never decomposes and kills our environment. So be aware of your programming, be aware of the language you use, be aware of how you treat others and try to step more and more in the direction of people. I believe who have ascended the programming people like the Dalai Lama, people like those before us, like Mahatma Gandhi, or uh, Mother Teresa, or people who are spiritual leaders, who are really pure spiritual leaders that are not dogmatic and seeking power, that are actually there to help you discover more of the God that resides within you. And I think that the more you can tap into that awareness of your programming and an understanding about where you want your life, your soul, your persona to evolve to, then you can start to be aware of the gap and start to close it and be more conscious of how you interact in the world and be a, and be a nicer person. <laughs> and I think that's, and that's, that's a beautiful thing. And I think that it's always a work in progress. Okay. And I, I really created uh, FM TV because we get programmed most effectively by that Trojan horse that we wheel into our living rooms, a TV, and it opens up on us and starts unleashing all this. You're not good enough. You're, the death pain for on, onto you. So how can we use this medium of TV, internet, to reprogram us to the positive, to see the opportunities and everything? 
And that's why I've dedicated myself and our team to bringing together the biggest collection of health, wellness, consci consciousness, transformative documentaries, yoga, meditation classes, expert interviews into one platform, streaming on all these devices now with Amazon Prime in the US so people can one click it there. We're on you know, Roku, uh, Android devices, Amazon Fire TV, um, and put all this effort into it so that people can consciously program themselves with good information and good news so that they can start to be, if they want to be, a more kinder, gentler, compassionate, healthy, conscious, happy human being. And I think that's generally characteristics that most people want. And, and, and that's, uh, that's, that's my, my mission and my message, I guess, for people that are listening to this. Amazing. Amazing. So where would be the best place to send everyone? Because you've got quite a few things to go to. Is it a website mothership? To, for yeah, people? well, there is. I mean, I, I think I want people to watch Transcendence. That's my main thing right now. So just go Google FMTV Transcendence. Perfect. You'll see a link there. You can find out about it and uh, start watching it. Or if you get lost, go to fmtv.com. That's it. And uh Come and join us. Come check it out. Watch some content. And, and I guarantee that it'll help you make a one degree shift. And a one degree shift is going to seem like nothing now, but you fast forward 8, 10, 12, 24, 50 years, you're way expanded, way more along a journey that you might want to take. If you're looking for more health and less disease, if you're looking for more happiness and purpose and fulfillment and less depression and anxiety, if you're looking for more expansive consciousness and more of a sense of spiritual connection and less disconnection, then that's why we created the channel. We'd love to invite you to be part of the community. And so that's where I'd send them. Beautiful. James, thank you so much for today. And uh, thanks for everything you do and everything you put out into the world. And you've, you've been a huge inspiration for, for me over the years as well. So uh, it's all greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Guy. Great chatting with you. And I love what you do as well. Well done, mate. Thanks, mate.